Hello everybody, and welcome to the Cold War Round 3. Um, now this picks up in 1956, and so what I want you to put this into context of is right after Hungary, right after the Hungarian uprising, right after Khrushchev uh, sends in troops, right after the Warsaw Pact, puts down that uprising. So it's going to run from here until 1968. Um, and the Prague Spring, which some of you already read about and the rest of you will read about tonight. Now, in the Cold War, uh, in round three rather, we're going to see all kinds of new escalations. And similar to round two, we're going to see some peaceful coexistence, but alongside other fierce competition. Now, the reason there's other fierce competition is because we're going to see all new venues for the Cold War. We're going to see more space race, more spying. Um, proxy wars escalate. And so there's going to be a lot of new things coming about. Also, during this round, inconveniently, is the closest the world ever came to nuclear war and nuclear annihilation. Um, and we'll get to that in the Cuban Missile Crisis. Now, that actually is going to lead to another round of detente. And again, as we said before, detente is an easing of tensions. Um, especially this is going to come out of being so afraid of how close they came to destroying each other and themselves um, that they're going to lead to detente. But there's still going to be escalations in other realms of the Cold War. And what we see, a trend that started earlier but really becomes very clear in this round, that a lot of times the Cold War itself is going to be driven by the leaders. It's going to be personality driven by the way these guys interact, by perceptions of the leaders of each country, um, be it the United States, Soviet Union in particular, even France um, is going to play a role in their leader. So let's get off with what would be one of the first big events of round three, and that is the launching of the space race. Now, you'll actually read a little bit more about the space race tonight, but in 1957, Soviet Union launched into space a satellite. Whoa, there it goes. Whoa, the first man-made satellite, um, Sputnik. Now, it was this tiny little three-foot metal ball, um, and all it did was launch a, uh, or send a satellite signal down to the United States. You could pick it up. Anybody had a radio could pick up this radio signal that it was sending. But what this symbolized is that the Russians had beat us to space. This was a technological edge. That's what it says down there. It kind of gets cut off. Um, now, again, we talked about the space race being about whose system is better. This is an example of their systems competing. Since they can't compete at war and show who is better and stronger in that capacity, the space race is a technological competition to show whose system is better. And right now, the Soviets are well ahead. Now also keep in mind what this means. If they can launch a satellite into space, what else can they launch into space? And the fear is, of course, of missiles, of nuclear weapons. And so that is, that's underlying all of the space race. And this is going to go really throughout a, a good solid decade and a half of the Cold War, really until uh, we land on the moon, which effectively ends the space race uh, in the next decade. Sorry, spoiler alert. Now, um, another event that happens is the kitchen debate, it's called. Khrushchev the premier of the Soviet Union, comes to the United States and meets with Vice President Nixon. He's Eisenhower's vice president. Now, Nixon was a diehard confirmed anti-communist, so he could safely meet with Khrushchev without having his American credentials called into question. Um, and this is a symbol of de-Stalinization. This is something Stalin would have never done. If you can imagine Stalin coming and meeting with the U.S. president in the U.S., um, so it's also a measure of detente. Um, now, what's funny is it's called the kitchen debate because um, we took him, the big place that the U.S. took Khrushchev to um, was basically a, a consumer goods show, like a kitchen show, um, to show him all the consumer goods we were producing, to show off all of the consumer goods. 
and the feel kind of, uh, you know, somewhat tongue-in-cheek was like, all right, so the Soviets have satellites, and the Soviets have Sputnik, and they're ahead in the space race, but dang gummit, we have dishwashers and washing machines, um, and we're ahead in that edge. Um, we're ahead in that race, and so, um, you know, even this friendly visit uh, was competitive, but it went over really well. They they really got along well. Khrushchev was impressed, and this looked like it was going to be, um, you know, maybe initiating a thawing of tensions. But then, um, wouldn't you know it? Oh, sorry, I'm I'm a little ahead of myself. Um, this just gives a nice look in 1959, so right after the Kitchen Debates, of who is where. You see in the blue, you have NATO members, and the light blue is the allies of the United States. In the red, you have the Warsaw Pact countries, and then you have allies of those Warsaw, Warsaw Pact countries, um, notably in the Middle East and, of course, uh, China, and we'll look at Vietnam there a little bit later. Um, and then just as interestingly is the non-aligned nations um, you know, some more of the Middle East, Yugoslavia, India, um, and then our neutral country of, uh, of Austria and Switzerland. Um, Ireland also still on the line. So going back to the kitchen debate, it looks like maybe things are getting into a period of easing tensions now. The U.S. and the Soviet Union seem like they're getting along. And then wouldn't you know it, we get busted for spying. Uh, the U-2 spy incident named for the U-2 plane, not the really awesome Irish band. Um, essentially, uh, an American pilot was shot down spying, um, and he lived. That was really kind of uh, the unfortunate part. I mean, not for him, but for the U.S. from a propaganda point of view. He was put on a very public trial, of which this is a picture of. Now, the thing is, is both sides knew the other one was spying on the other. And as long as you didn't get caught, there really wasn't anything that could be done about it. There really wasn't anything that either side could say. But this was our best spy plane, and they shot it down, and they busted us. And we had to essentially give them all kinds of aid, all kinds of food and money to get our pilot back alive. Um, and it was a huge embarrassment, and it really made the U.S. look bad. And it really kind of derails that detente that was just starting with the, uh, with the kitchen debate. And so things are going to escalate again. Um, and next, we're going to get one of the most dramatic events of the Cold War. And it's also going to become one of the symbols of the Cold War. So here's the story first. In Berlin, don't forget, Berlin is entirely within the Soviet sphere. But West Berlin is this little island of Western Europe, this little island of the West within the Soviet sphere. And what was happening was every day people would, from East Berlin, the Soviet sphere, travel to West Berlin, just going across the street, and then they would flee to the West. You couldn't flee to the West from East Berlin or from Czechoslovakia or Hungary. But it was just a simple matter of going across the street to um, West Berlin, and then you could get anywhere you wanted to go. Until one night in 1961, overnight, a fence went up all around West Berlin. Now, again, I think it's important to remember that this fence is going up around West Berlin. But the objective was to keep the East Berliners in. From West Berlin, you could very easily go to West Germany. There was these roads, they were open. Um, you were allowed to go. It just was like passing through uh, another country, a passport. But what this was doing was locking the East Berliners in the Eastern Zone. Don't forget, West Berlin is the Western Zone. And so now they are locked out of that. They cannot get in there. And this is just a further demonstration of the failure of the Soviet system. The only way they could get people to stay in was by locking them uh, locking them in, locking them in the system. This is connected very closely to the Hungarian uprising. The only way they could get people to stay in was through force, was through violence. And this wall just becomes another example of that. Um, and more than anything else, 
the Berlin Wall becomes a symbol of the Cold War. It was a wall that was literally, like I said, the fence was put up overnight. And then over the next couple years, the wall gets bigger and taller. Um, it's 10, 12 feet tall at points, barbed wire, checkpoints, um, guard towers. Uh, dozens of people were shot and killed trying to get through. Uh, the picture in the lower left there is a very famous picture of a guard making a break for it. Um, and this becomes the symbol of the Cold War, the city divided um, and just the ideological um, problems that the Soviet sphere is already having at this early stage, convincing its people that it is the better system. I want you to take a minute right now and talk with your partner about why you think the Berlin Wall became such a symbol. More than anything else, why was this a symbol of the confrontation of the Cold War? And we're back. Uh, now, the next event is the most dramatic single event um, possibly of the entire Cold War. Um, as we look at some other pictures of the Berlin Wall, sorry, um, and the very famous Checkpoint Charlie. Uh, that was the third Checkpoint Alpha Bravo Charlie um, going between West Berlin and um, East Germany. Um, but now, back to the most famous event of the Cold War, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Now, at the very short version of the story, the Cuban Missile Crisis was the Soviet Union putting uh, nuclear weapons in Cuba um, that could then be used against the United States. Now, first let's talk about why this happened. Um, really, the Cuban Missile Crisis came about as a response to the failures of the United States in this round of the Cold War so far. Um, the USSR is feeling tough. They're feeling like they have an advantage over the United States and they want to press that advantage as much as, much as possible. Um, in just the last few years, we have the United States losing ground in the space race with the launch of Sputnik. Um, right after JFK became president, um, there was a failed invasion of Cuba called the Bay of Pigs invasion, and it made the U.S. look ridiculous. Um, the Berlin Wall went up, and even though in hindsight we can see this is a failure of the Soviet system, the West couldn't do anything to stop it, so they looked weak. And also there's just a general perception of JFK seeming like a weak president. Um, I mean, you know, if you look from the Soviet view, they've gone from FDR to Truman, who wasn't real respected but had the nerve to drop the bomb. Um, Eisenhower was a decorated war hero. And now you have this young, boyishly young, really inexperienced politician who to a lot of the world basically got the position because his daddy bought the election for him. And he's seen as weak. And the Soviet Union thinks they can press their advantage here. Now, what happens is the Soviet Union puts missiles in Cuba. And this means that now the main cities of the United States, all of those cities you can see on the map, are within range of Soviet missiles. Now, why that is such a big deal is because if they launched, we would not have time to launch a counter strike before those cities would be devastated. Now, we actually did have missiles in Turkey. But we didn't think anybody knew about it. So we thought this was just kind of even, but it wasn't really what we wanted. So here's what happens. We discover, and that's what these images are, these are satellite images of uh, the missile bases in Cuba, uh, which was communist, by the way, under Castro and just recently undergone a revolution um, under Fidel Castro. And the Soviet Union is going to resupply and bring more missiles into Cuba. And JFK calls together his advisors and we say, we can't allow them in. We're going to blockade it. But then JFK is told, you can't blockade a neutral country. That is in itself an act of war. You can't just blockade Cuba. So we make up that we are quarantining Cuba for disease outbreak purposes and nobody's allowed to get in. We have our battleships at the outside of the quarantine, that's the blockade zone on your map, and the Soviet ships are cruising in, getting closer to closer. Um, they are saying, you can't blockade this. We're saying, we're not blockading it, we're quarantining it. 
Um, and both sides have their fingers on the button ready to launch. It is extremely tense at this point. Uh, and people all over the world are preparing for nuclear war. This was not a unreal possibility. This was very real. Um, the use of the nuclear bombs in World War II was still fresh in people's minds. And everybody knew these missiles were built to be used, not just built to sit there. So now, here comes the real interesting part of the story. And this is just story time, so just kind of listen. So the Kennedy team is sitting and they're trying to figure out what they're going to do, how they're going to react to this. And one of JFK's uh, closest advisors was his brother, Robert Kennedy. And they get a telegram late at night from Khrushchev that says, I'm willing to do anything to avoid war. We will pull our ships back. And the Kennedys are ecstatic. They feel like they have won this, and this is exactly what they wanted. And then they get a second telegram shortly later, also from Khrushchev, that says, but in exchange for pulling back our ships, we want you to take your missiles out of Cuba. To which the Kennedy team is astounded. They didn't think the Soviets knew about They They want to take the missiles out of Turkey. Sorry, the Soviet Union wants the U.S. to take U.S. missiles out of Turkey. Sorry about that. So pretty much an exchange. And the U.S. is flabbergasted. They didn't know the Soviet Union knew we had missiles in Turkey. So they're trying to figure out what, they, what they're going to do, and they don't want to take their missiles out of Turkey. They're trying to figure this out. And then Robert Kennedy essentially comes up with a response. He says, respond to the first telegram. And Jack Kennedy doesn't understand, and Robert Kennedy says, respond to the first telegram where Khrushchev unilaterally said he would stop his ships and take missiles out of Cuba. And they do that. And then they publicize the whole thing that Khrushchev made the efforts to avoid war, and he was going to do this. And it really looks like the USSR blinked. Um, take a second right now and analyze this political cartoon. Talk with your partner and... Uh, Analyze this political cartoon. Make sure you look at all the little parts in here. Go ahead. Yeah. Yes, I got it. One second. Um, so what we see here is the United States comes off with a big victory in the Cuban Missile Crisis. And a um, couple months later, they actually agree to take their missiles out of Turkey very quietly. So nobody hears about it. The press doesn't hear about it. And it's clear that the U.S. has won this. Now, my favorite part of this story, what just happened? My favorite part of this story is after the Cuban Missile Crisis goes, on the Soviet Union's insistence, they hook up a red line, the red phone, a direct line between the White House and the Kremlin. Because, at the Soviet Union's insistence, da, da Sidania. They say they want better communication between the two countries, so there's no mistakes about anything in the future. And this is where the very famous red phone comes in, and it was a direct line between the White House um, and the Kremlin. And it was a, a fixture of the Oval Office um, all the way through the end of the Cold War. Um, and this shows that the desire for better communications. And ultimately what we see is both sides trying to work together because, as I said in the intro to this, they were so scared of what just almost happened. They want to try to make sure they avoid nuclear war in the future and avoid coming this close to nuclear war again. Um, so even though things are going to be tense, never again are things going to get this close to nuclear war. Now, the question I always wonder right now is, is there still a red phone? If it is still there, does it still look like a rotary phone? And if it is still there, who does it go to now? Not now, Vladimir. I'm busy. All right, moving on. Uh, we need to talk about the next proxy war, the very big proxy war. Um, the Vietnam War. Now, the Vietnam War actually does not start as a United States war. We are not involved in it. It actually it's called the Dirty War, and it starts as part of decolonization. So this is a war for independence. The Vietnamese want independence from France. This was part of French Indochina, and they want to get their independence from France. 
Um, and so they're fighting, and it's going very, very poorly. Um, the war, as you can see, goes from 1946 to 1954. Um, in 1954, the French leave. They get out. They say, you know what? We can't do this anymore. We're out of here. The U.S. starts getting involved in 1955. We start sending in advisors. We're trying to help South Vietnam not lose to North Vietnam, which was communist, as you can see here on the map. Um, so we're never really there helping the French. It's after the French leave that we step in. Now, the whole reason we are fighting this proxy war is, once again, same as Korea, is the domino theory. We do not want another Asian nation to fall to communism for fear that all of the other ones will. Um, now, ultimately, in a story tried and true and told many, many times, um, this war goes very poorly for the United States. Um, it is a horrible war. Um, it is fought in people's living rooms because of newspapers and TVs. Um, it's the first very televised war. Um, and the big picture for our perspective is it really diminishes the status of the U.S. in the eyes of the world. In their allies in Europe and even in their enemies, the U.S. looks weak. They can't pull off this war. And this ragtag group of communists is defeating what everybody thought was the most powerful nation in the world. And this is going to have reverberations for the next couple decades from a U.S. perspective, really, for the next 30 years. Um, but from a, a European perspective and a global perspective, at least the next 20 years. Um, now we get to some more family issues. And these kind of tie into the lecture you watched last night, um, the family and domestic issues. There's strains within NATO. Um, basically, the United States and Europe have a disagreement on the way NATO should be handled and the way it should be done. U.S. wanted mixed national forces, so U.S. troops, British troops, French troops, and the United States being the only one with nuclear weapons. That's how they thought NATO should be. They didn't want more nuclear weapons around. They wanted to control the nukes. They didn't want to get drawn into a nuclear conflict by their allies. But they wanted everybody else to have national, have troops on the ground. France and Great Britain basically say, we don't want to take, we don't want to play second fiddle to you. We want our own nuclear weapons, and we want more of a say in what's going on. Um, the U.S. isn't a real huge fan of this, so they, they're balking at this. They're, they don't want Europe to have more of a say with NATO. They see them as junior partners. So France in 1966 says, you know what, to hell with it. We're taking our troops out of NATO. They still stay in NATO, but they're taking out their contribution of troops. And this is, again, de Gaulle. And this is a huge slap in the face. I mean, this is the country that wants to be a leader in Europe, and they're taking out their NATO troops. Now, things don't get any better as time goes on. Europe is committing, uh, contributing the vast majority of troops, but the U.S. is paying for almost all of this. And then in the 1970s, when the U.S. economy goes sour, they want Europe to pick up more of the tab, which is just causing more tensions. Um, and then there's just kind of a perspective issue on what NATO is and what NATO should be. Europe saw NATO as a pure defensive alliance, that if the Soviet Union attacks, this is what is there to help save us. The U.S. wants Europe to support them everything because they're allies including Vietnam and Europe just doesn't see it that way and so there's just a difference in the way they view what NATO's entire purpose is all right now we get a changing of the guard essentially after his failure in the Cuban Missile Crisis Nikita Khrushchev is ousted takes a bit of backroom politics um, it takes some other minor domestic mistakes of his, but he is pushed out. And the guy who is going to repla replace him is Lenoid Brezhnev. Everybody say Brezhnev. Very good. Now, Brezhnev is a fantastic example of Soviet bureaucracy. Um, he's not very smart. He's not very talented. Um, but he rises to the top because of party allegiance, because he was always on the right committees, because he made the right friends, and he was in the right place at the right time. Uh, there's actually a word for that. They call it an apparatchik. It's A-P-P-A-R-A-T-C-H-I-K. Um, 
the word apparatchik just has negative connotations. It means like it basically just what I said. He's not a quality leader. He's probably not that bright. He doesn't have a great attitude about it. Um, but he was able to rise to the top because um, because of the Soviet bureaucracy, because he played the game correctly. Now, you also see that he rules for an, a very large chunk of the Cold War, from 1964 to 1982. Um, and so he and his relative incompetence is going to have a very big factor in the Cold War. Um, now, his policies are essentially one of re-Stalinization. He saw Khrushchev's weakness as trying to get too buddy-buddy with the West, and so he is going to bring back a hard-line approach with the West. Um, so re-Stalinization is an important term to associate with him. He also reigns almost an uninterrupted period of economic stagnation. Um, really, they develop, they have no growth whatsoever, economic growth whatsoever, no increase in consumer goods, and they become increasingly reliant um, on aid, including aid from the United States, by the way. Just as a little side note, we wanted to kind of keep them on the bribe. Um, and so this was, uh, you know, he, he's going to be around for a long time, um, but he's not renowned for any real positive achievements. And in fact, what he is most renowned for is his role in the Prague Spring. Now, the Prague Spring is a very, very important event. It has connections to the past. It obviously plays a very big role in the Cold War. It also is really important for it later when the Cold War ends. On a basic term, uh, on the most basic measure, the Prague Spring is an eight-month rebellion, period of liberalization. Um, so I want you to put this in the same mind as the Hungarian Revolution of 1956. Um, they don't like the economic centralization. They don't like feeling like they're exploited. Um, this is Czechoslovakia, by the way. They don't like feeling like they're being taken advantage of as a Warsaw state. They don't like they, they're feeling taken advantage of by the Soviet Union. Um, they don't like being dominated by the USSR. Um, it's led by this man down here, um, Alexander Dubček. Everybody say Dubček. Good. Um, and... Uh, what they basically pass is a whole series of reforms, um, rights to citizens, freedom of speech, freedom of the media, freedom to travel without the papers that are going to be required. Um, they want to decentralize the economy and make steps to do that, to make it not a command economy and not so tied with the Soviet Union. They're also going to outlaw the one-party system and democratize uh, Czechoslovakia. Um, and this is a very big deal. Now, the big difference between this and Hungary is that Hungary only lasted two weeks. The Prague Spring lasts eight months. And the Soviet Union doesn't like what's going on, but Dubček is skilled enough of a leader. He never denounces the Soviet Union. He never breaks with them. He never threatens to leave the Warsaw Pact. And so he's essentially able to string the Soviet Union along for a long period of time. He was hoping that once... Um, once critical mass started moving, the Soviet Union wouldn't be able to do anything um, to roll this back. And so after months of negotiations um, and trying to bring things to a halt, once again, Warsaw troops are sent in. Warsaw Pact troops are sent in from Russia, East Germany, Poland, Hungary, Bulgaria. Um, and this is a very big deal. This is just as violent. Um, as hungry, just as frightening to the people, and, and perhaps even more so because in those intervening eight months, um, people really got the feeling in Czechoslovakia that maybe this was going to happen, that maybe this was possible. And so the harsh put down uh, was even more frightening, was even more intimidating. Now, we'll talk about the Brezhnev Doctrine here a little bit more in detail in, on the next slide. But essentially what the Brezhnev Doctrine says is that the USSR was not going to let anyone out of the Soviet sphere. That that wasn't going to happen, that they were in the Soviet sphere, that that was part of their right to keep those countries and keep those peoples in. And that's what the Brezhnev Doctrine stated. Um, and after the tanks were rolled in, 
um, a Soviet-friendly government was replaced, and all reforms were undone. Now, let's talk a little bit more detail about this Brezhnev Doctrine. The basic definition that you have um, is what you need to know, but I want to give you some more detail about it. This is actually a passage. This is actually a speech that Brezhnev gave when describing this. He says, when forces that are hostile to socialism try to turn the development of some socialist country towards capitalism, it becomes not only a problem of the country concerned, but a, prob a common problem and concern of all socialist countries. This is the opposite or the response to the Truman Doctrine. Um, now, the Brezhnev Doctrine was used to justify the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia. This is why they said they were doing it. They also used it to justify earlier Soviet invasions of Hungary in 1956, as well as a couple other small-scale rebellions they put down. Um, so it's used retroactively. Now, what they said they were going to do was that the Soviets considered um, that, that Eastern Bloc a strategic buffer of NATO, with NATO. Um, and they couldn't have any democratic liberalization along those countries um, because that would compromise Soviet dominance within the Eastern Bloc, which then could compromise the Soviet Union's own strategic defense of their country against NATO. So they're basically saying we need this Eastern Bloc as a buffer against NATO. Now, again, this ties back to our conversation about was NATO an aggressive move? Was it seen as aggressive? Um, and I think that this response shows that that's how the Soviet Union saw it. Um, now, uh, essentially, within the Eastern Bloc, um, this means the Soviet Union is going to completely dominate the Communist Party and completely dominate everything in that Eastern Bloc. There is going to be no autonomy whatsoever. Um, what the Brezhnev Doctrine said is no country is going to be allowed to leave the Warsaw Pact. Um, no country could disturb, um, nobody could disturb the Communist Party's monopoly on power at all um, because that would compromise the cohesiveness of the Eastern Bloc and again then diminish that buffer of protection between the Soviet Union and the NATO countries. And the real kicker is that the Soviet Union reserved the right to define socialism and capitalism. So even if a Warsaw Pact country like Czechoslovakia said, no, 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 we're not doing capitalism. This is just a different form of socialism. Um, that was not going to be allowed. The Soviet Union was going to define that. Now, given this, I want you to talk with your partner why is it called the Prague Spring? <coughs> Why that use of spring? Not just because of when it happened, but think of our Cold War metaphors. Why is it called the Prague Spring? Go ahead and have that conversation. Now, the last conversation I want you to have is what role do you think this Brezhnev Doctrine is going to play as we move forward? Um, how do you think this is going to change relations? Do you think this is going to change relations between the West and the Soviet Union? And what do you think this does for relations between the Soviet Union and its Eastern Bloc satellite states? Um, thank you for listening, guys. Thank you for taking care of this. And you've got uh, a few reading assignments that you need to take care of now. Um, a 1968 read and mark up, a quick DBQ quiz. Uh, you're going to read and mark up about the space race, and then you're going to read a little bit about Vatican II and compare that to the last big church council we talked about, the Council of Trent. I will see you all tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Das Vidanya.